So, I am Dr. Julie Ferguson. You are very welcome to call me Julie, because I called all of my undergrad professors by their first names. It feels strange not to do that. Um, otherwise, Dr. Ferguson or Professor Ferguson would be fine. You are in an Earth System Science class. So, what Earth is Earth System Science? It's a somewhat new way of looking at the Earth, but it makes a lot of sense. So the idea is, is that our department, and increasingly uh, other sort of, uh, environmental departments, see that it's impossible to study just one aspect of the Earth. It's impossible to study just geology or just the oceans without really taking into account everything else that's going on on the planet. And so this is the science that studies the whole Earth as a system of many interacting parts and focuses on the changes within and between those parts. And so to make life easier for ourselves, we do subdivide that down into four main uh, parts, which we call reservoirs. We have the biosphere, which is all of the living material on Earth. We have the hydrosphere, which is our oceans, our lakes, our ice, um, our precipitation. We have uh, the lithosphere or the geosphere, it's the same thing. And that's our solid Earth, it's basically the geology um, part of the Earth. And then we have what we're going to talk about for this quarter, which is the atmosphere. And that's the mixture of gases, so things like nitrogen, argon, oxygen, that make up uh, our atmosphere. And the idea is, is that it's impossible to study the atmosphere without really thinking about all of these other parts. And as we go through the rest of the lecture today, I want you to really think about that. And we'll come back at the end and really think about how the atmosphere has been shaped by these different interactions uh, between these different uh, reservoirs on Earth. So here's our lecture one. We're going to talk about composition and the evolution of our atmosphere, because our atmosphere hasn't always had the same mixture of gases that it has today. It's been vastly different in the past. Um, and so does anyone know what planet is on the left? Venus, absolutely, is also known as Earth's evil twin. Um, because it's a pretty miserable place to be. It's slightly closer to the sun than us, um, and it's very, very much hotter. Um, and you can see that it looks remarkably different. Okay? And so what the question we want to ask today is, why are they so different? What has happened on Earth in its history that has made it in, so look and, and be so different from Venus, which is basically the same size as us, it's just that little bit closer towards the sun. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. So first of all, uh, because we can't avoid them, we have a few quick def uh, definitions. So uh, if you've ever wondered what the difference is between air and atmosphere, Basically, anything can have an atmosphere. So Mars has a tiny bit of atmosphere left. Venus has an atmosphere. An atmosphere is that mixture of gases surrounding a planet or anything, uh, a celestial body such as a moon. Um, air is what is specific to Earth. That's what we are breathing. We are breathing air. So that mixture of gases, but also little tiny particles that are so small that they stay suspended in the air. That's what we, uh, we talk about. And so if we're also going to talk about weather, what is weather? It's really the state of the atmosphere in any one particular place at any one particular time. And so the things that we might talk about to characterize that weather is how hot it is, so the temperature. We might talk about air pressure, whether we're under high pressure or low pressure how humid we are. If any of you have ever been over to the East Coast in the middle of summer, it's miserable, right? Because it's so sticky and humid. And we'll talk about why it feels so different to us um, when we have that really high humidity. We have cloudiness. We have some amazing cool clouds out there today. And then we have wind speed and direction. So those are the five things that really characterize weather. And we'll look in, in turn at each of these in the next uh, couple of weeks. When we talk about climate and climate change, what we're talking about is the average weather. So I think my favorite uh, saying for this is, uh, climate is what you expect, weather is what you get. So whenever I have friends from England visit, they bring shorts and swimming stuff, and then it rains pretty consistently for about a week. 
Okay? And so climate is what you expect, weather is what you get. And so when I talk about those little suspended particles, we actually have a specific name for them. They're called aerosols. And so uh, these are these tiny liquid droplets or tiny solid particles that are so small that they stay suspended in air. The movement of the air keeps them from falling to the ground, at least for a while. And so some of the things that contribute to aerosols are smoke. So you can see here a beautiful satellite image of the forest fires um, that hit uh, the area, I think, in two, yep, 2003. So what particular wind pattern are we seeing here? Does anyone know what we call this sort of time when we see a lot of fires and the winds go out to the ocean? Not quite. Something is the, also the name of a town locally. Santa Ana's. So we know that when we have Santa Ana winds, it feels really dry. That air is coming from inland, and it's going out to sea. And also, we tend to see fires. So we'll also talk about why those Santa Ana winds are so hot and dry uh, when we get to it. Other things are things like ice crystals, really high up in the atmosphere or closer to the poles. Sea salt crystals, whenever you see waves breaking at the beach, then we get that sea spray going into the atmosphere and little particles, little bits of salt end up in the atmosphere as that droplet dries out. Dust, we have lots of big sort of dust uh, storms coming off uh, areas of land. Volcanic emissions, we've all seen those sort of big eruptive uh, volcanoes and the amount of particles they put out. And then also industrial pollution, okay? So somewhat obvious question of the, of the day. Which of the images there relates to an anthropogenic or a human cause of aerosols being put into the atmosphere? Okay, so have a look for a second. You can consult your neighbor. Which of those is an anthropogenic source? And I will be argued with about some of these. OK, any more answers for me? Right, let's see what people thought. Whether my obvious question was obvious. Yes, it was. Good. But a certain number of people but C, and that's why I said I would be argued with, because forest fires, if they're set by humans, could be an anthropogenic source to the atmosphere as well. Um, it depends whether that fire was natural or not, because there are very large forest fires that are triggered by lightning um, and are perfectly natural additions of uh, aerosols to the atmosphere. But definitely B is not something that would happen if we were not here on Earth. OK, great. So let's talk about Earth's first atmosphere. So if we go back very, very early, does anyone know off the top of their heads how old the Earth is roughly? Yeah, absolutely. Good work. It went in at school at some point, didn't it? 4.5 billion years or so. OK. And just after Earth sort of formed, it actually had an atmosphere composed entirely of hydrogen and helium. Um, and really, that's because they were the most common elements in the solar system. If we look at what makes up our sun, it's mostly hydrogen and helium. If we look at what makes up those gas giants like Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, all of those ones, they're mostly hydrogen and helium. Um, but here on the terrestrial planets, the rocky planets, we lost that early atmosphere. And we really lost it very quickly in geological timescales. My sense of time is completely screwed up. Um, so over the first 50 million years or so, we lost that because, first of all, hydrogen and helium are not retained by gravity. What do you know about hydrogen and helium on the periodic table? Are they this big or this big? They're small, absolutely. They're the lightest elements in our periodic table. And so our gravity on Earth is just not strong enough to keep them. That's why Jupiter managed to keep all of its hydrogen and helium, because its gravity is that much stronger. It's retained it. But here on Earth, we're losing hydrogen and helium. And this is why you have to make the most of your lovely helium balloons. 
because all of that helium, once it escapes into the atmosphere, is gradually being lost out to space even today. Um, does anyone know where we get helium from, by the way? The ground, isn't that weird? We mine it. So yes, um, our helium supplies are finite. And this is a concern because we need lots of liquid helium to operate some of our medical machinery. And so the question is, should we really be using it for somewhat frivolous purposes such as helium balloons? Um, the other reasons that we lost that uh, early atmosphere was that we didn't actually have a magnetic field yet. And that's actually a really important part of retaining our atmosphere. The reason that Mars has lost a lot of its atmosphere is that that hydrogen and helium and other gases that likely uh, formed around Mars have just been stripped away uh, by the solar wind, the stream of really highly energetic particles that comes out from the sun the whole time. And it's deflected by our magnetic field. But with Mars, it just slams into the planet, slams into the atmosphere, and it's carried away those gases. So our magnetic field is really important for us being able to retain our atmosphere and so actually have life on this, this planet. And the last thing is collisions. Oh, yeah. Um, we're supposed to have life on, uh, like if we're going to have settlements on Mars, then how would we go about that if we don't have a magnetic field? That's a really good question. And it's one of the problems with actually sending astronauts out to Mars as well. Have you heard that it's a one-way trip, right? Because your body is going to be pretty riddled by cancer by the time you get there. And that's because these really energetic particles, when they hit your skin, when they, they do damage to your cells and your DNA. And so it's definitely something that if we were to have settlements on Mars, we'll have to build pretty strong screens as well to stop that, that happening. So there are definitely a number of very, very strong engineering challenges to face with that. But it'll be interesting to see how that happens. So, so yes, our last one is collisions. So who here knows how the moon formed? It's there, right? Why is it there? OK, I'll show you a little video, because you've probably heard, fed up with my voice by now. So there you go. Now you know how the moon formed. And uh, when you next see it up in the sky, hopefully you get a different impression for just why it's there and uh, the very violent way that it very first formed. Um, and obviously, any early atmosphere that we had when that happened would have just been blasted off into space at that time. Um, and so really, we had to start from scratch. After that moon forming collision, we were basically just a bare ball of rock again. And so what we have to think about is where did our gases come from to sort of form a new atmosphere after that first one was lost? And the answer is from volcanoes and comets. And so I think this is a really cool idea. We're still not in exactly certain what percentage from each of those. But next time you drink your glass of water, think about this, that maybe half of that water, or at sort of half to sort of 70, 80% or so, was actually erupted from a volcano early in Earth's history and put into the atmosphere. And maybe 20% of that water, perhaps a little less, actually was brought into the Earth by comets that collided very early in Earth's history. And that's where our sort of water came from, and where that CO2 as well came from, um, from these volcanoes and comets. And so even today, when we have volcanic eruption, gases are being added to our atmosphere in tiny, tiny amounts. Um, but still, um, over time, this sort of buildup of gases from these events is what created our second atmosphere. But we have a problem, right? So here is the composition of those gases from different volcanoes today. And you can see that mostly what they put out is water vapor, carbon dioxide, and sulfur dioxide, that really nasty sort of hydrogen sulfide as well, and, and pretty other nasty gases. Is that what makes up our atmosphere today? No, absolutely. We'd be very unhappy if we got put into an atmosphere like that, because we'd die off pretty quickly. So our atmosphere today is mainly nitrogen, oxygen, and argon, with a tiny little uh, amount of other gases in there. So the question is, how did we go from our atmosphere of mainly water vapor and carbon dioxide into our atmosphere today, which is nitrogen, oxygen, argon? So I have a few questions for you. What happened to that atmospheric water? Okay. 
What happened to the atmospheric CO2? What happened to that carbon? And where did the oxygen come from? So I'm going to give you uh, sort of three or four minutes to think about this with your neighbors. The TAs will wander around with you as well. So think, what happened to that atmospheric water? Where is water today on Earth? Obvious one. What happened to atmospheric CO2? That's a, a more difficult one. Where do you find carbon today? And then the second more, more obvious one is, where did the oxygen come from? Okay. So three or four minutes to think about that, and the TAs will wander around as well um, if you have any questions. Okay, well I had some good answers from the side over here, so I'm going to pick on you guys today, and I'll take turns for who I pick on. So first of all, obvious answer, what happened to the atmospheric water vapor? Where is it today? The oceans, absolutely. Where did that water come from to make our oceans? It came from these volcanoes that put um, water vapor into the atmosphere. And over time, as our planet cooled down after its formation, then that, that, the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere couldn't be held by the atmosphere. And so it sort of condensed out. And it condensed out and condensed out. And over time, it built up to form our oceans. So definitely today, um, that's where much of that water vapor has gone. What would happen if we increased our planet's temperature again? What would happen to the amount of water vapor in our atmosphere, perhaps? It would increase again, absolutely. And so um, the temperature has an important role to play in how much water vapor is in our atmosphere. Slightly more tricky, but I had some good answers. What happened to the CO2? Where is carbon found today? Humans, absolutely. What else? Plants take it in, absolutely. So the biosphere, an organic molecule by definition, has these carbon-hydrogen bonds in it. And so life is, is made up of a huge amount of the carbon. Um, what else? Where else might that carbon have gone? Yeah. The oceans. And this is a really important one that people don't think about. A lot of carbon dioxide today is dissolving in our oceans. Our oceans have taken up half of the extra carbon dioxide we've put in the atmosphere from burning um, things. And so they're, they're really helping us out. And you know, just like when you take the cap off your soda, it fizzes, right? We have a certain amount of CO2 dissolved in that soda. We also have a certain amount, in fact, quite a lot of, of carbon dissolved in our oceans. Where else is it? Why do we have increasing CO2 levels in the, the atmosphere today? What are we doing? We are definitely melting the ice, but what, what are we doing that puts carbon into the atmosphere? Burning fossil fuels. So the clue is in the name, fossil fuels, oil, coal, gas. They're formed from the remains of ancient plants and animals that have been compressed and baked underground for a very long time. And so what we're doing is very quickly taking those fossil fuels and burning them and putting that carbon back into the atmosphere. We'll talk more about that on uh, Thursday. What else? There's one other big place where we would get carbon. ESS1 people should know this. It was one of our negative feedbacks. No? What's chalk made up of? What's the formula for chalk? Does anyone know? Or limestone? What, what's it made up of? Calcium carbonate, right? Rocks. A lot of carbon is actually stored in the form of rocks. It's organic matter in rock and also as carbonates, as carbon compounds. And so if we look at where that carbon is today near Earth's surface, then yes, we have a certain amount in the biosphere, probably a similar amount in the oceans to on land. We have a lot more in the atmosphere. We have many times what's in the atmosphere actually dissolved in our oceans. We have sort of uh, 800 units or so um, of, in fossil fuels. But look at how much we have in shales, which is a type of sort of mud rock um, and carbonate rocks. A huge amount of that carbon has been locked away by the geology. It's locked away as rocks. So even if our atmosphere mainly consisted of carbon dioxide in the past, through time, 
that is actually being locked away. And the process by which that happens is called chemical weathering. <coughs> So you know if you've go, gone to a really ancient graveyard or something like that, you can see that those gravestones are, are etching away. Or if you've been to Europe to so some of the really old buildings, you can see that those, that rock is sort of uh, starting to weather away. And that's because even the small amount of CO2 in our atmosphere dissolves in the <coughs> rain, the raindrops when they fall. And that produces carbonic acid. It's a very weak acid, but it's still an acid. And that eats away that sort of reacts basically with rock over very, very, very long time scales. Um, and so that then sort of dissolves that rock and it forms these different compounds, things like calcium carbonate um, and other stuff. So that's where our carbon is today and it's something that's perhaps surprising um, for if you haven't thought about it before. So that's what happened to our atmospheric water vapor and CO2, but now how, let's think about how we get our other gases. So where does nitrogen come from? It's not something we saw on that table of gases released by volcanoes. It is actually released by volcanoes, but a tiny, tiny, tiny amount at a time. And the reason that it's built up is that once it's in the atmosphere, it's basically really difficult to get it out of the atmosphere. It's really chemically unreactive. And so once it's up there, it takes a very, very, very long time for any particular process to remove it. So life is one way that we can get nitrogen from the atmosphere. And also lightning is another way that we can turn that sort of N2, that really unreactive nitrogen, into something that life can use. Okay? And so that's why nitrogen has built up, especially as we removed that water vapor, as that we removed that CO2, then that nitrogen has built up through time. So how about argon? Argon is another noble gas, and so it's also really, really unreactive. So just like nitrogen, even though it's released in tiny amounts, once it's up there, it's not going anywhere. And so if we think about so the 4 billion year history or 4.5 billion year history of the Earth, then over time it's just built up and built up until it sort of makes up a large part of our atmosphere today. And that argon actually isn't released by volcanoes, that argon is actually uh, from the radioactive decay of potassium in our rocks. So things like granite, if you ever go up to the Sierra Nevada mountains and see those amazing granite mountains and those domes, the potassium in those rocks gradually decays through time and becomes argon, which is released into the atmosphere. So again, once you take your breath in, think about where those gases uh, that you're breathing came from and how long they've been in our atmosphere. And then lastly, most obvious one of the day, where did the oxygen in our atmosphere come from? Photosynthesis, thank you, absolutely. That process by which plants take in carbon dioxide and they use energy from the sun and then they produce sort of simple sugars, things like glucose, uh, their plant material, um, and then oxygen and energy as well, okay? And so, if we think about when that started happening on Earth, because obviously it's been building up through time yet again, the, probably the earliest photosynthesis happened as, as early as 3.5 billion years ago in the oceans. But it really wasn't until 2.5 billion years ago that we started seeing even minuscule amounts of free oxygen, so O2, floating around in our atmosphere. And so let's think about that for a second. Why is there one billion years in Earth's history where stuff was making oxygen, but it wasn't building up in the atmosphere? What happens to your lovely car if you leave it next to a sprinkler out in the open air for many years? Will it be fine when you come back to it? What will it have done? It's rusted. It's reacting with that oxygen. And that's basically what our planet did for a billion years. It rusted. Okay, we can find huge deposits of basically iron oxide um, from that sort of time. And it took a long time for everything to oxidize, and so that it took a long time for that free oxygen to end up building up in our atmosphere. But by the time we get to maybe 550 million years or so ago, which not coincidentally is the time when life got really interesting, um, between that time and now, it's made up between 15 and 35% of our Earth's atmosphere, okay? And that 35% is actually much higher than it is today. 
So one of the, the really cool times in Earth's history is called the Carboniferous. It's when a lot of our coal was formed. And the oxygen levels at that time were really, really high. And one of the very cool things that happened when oxygen gets that high is that insects get really, really, really big. Because they breathe through their skin. And so when you get higher oxygen concentrations, they can grow bigger because their surface area doesn't matter as much. And so we had dragonflies the size of eagles swooping around. We had pretty nasty looking spiders that would eat your cat quite happily. Um, we had uh, a millipede that was about the length of a car and could quite happily rear up and look me in the eye. And so it's a really fun time on Earth. And there's a little, uh, the, what the B <laughs> I know, right? But the BBC did a really sort of fun fake documentary, sort of showing what life was like at that time. So that's what that little link is for there. What do you think might set the upper limit on the amount of oxygen we have in our atmosphere? What might be a problem if we have too much oxygen? Fire, absolutely. So if you have too much oxygen, you know this at uh, hospitals, right? Because you're not meant to smoke, definitely, or have naked flames in hospitals because of the oxygen supplies. If you have too much oxygen, everything just burns really well. And so at that time, that Carboniferous, we also saw a much higher incidence of fires um, that would happen. And so that's really what sets our upper limit. Above that, we'd have such frequent fires um, that really that oxygen is combined again with the carbon to produce CO2. So it's really cool to see the, the Earth's sort of little feedback loops. So coming back to our very first question. So let's think about those things that happened on Earth that were so special. Okay, so Venus, it doesn't have the moon. It's one of the only planets that actually rotates the other way around. Okay, but it's about the same size as Earth, so you can think about whether it would actually have any hydrogen and helium. You can think about what sort of would have formed its atmosphere, probably something similar to what happened on Earth. But what has happened subsequently in Earth's history that hasn't happened on Venus that has meant that we've ended up with a different composition of the atmosphere? So talk to your neighbors and think for a little bit about what do you think the composition of Venus would be today if we went and measured it. OK, let's see how good we are at this. So I will go with the majority here. I think that's pretty good. And that's actually what we would measure. So let's think about that a second. So if uh, A is really what the composition of the Earth's atmosphere is, and the real difference between us and Venus is that Earth has developed life, and there's really no evidence that we can find that Venus ever had life or has life today. And so it hasn't had that photosynthesis. It hasn't been releasing uh, oxygen. It hasn't been locking away carbon in the biosphere um, and therefore in the, the, sort of the rocks as well. Okay? Um, you're right that it can't necessarily be B, because although argon is released, it's released very, very in low amounts compared to what volcanoes released in terms of CO2. And the only reason that it's built up so much in the atmosphere today is we've taken out all of that CO2 and water vapor. And so and now it's a major component. But if we left all of those other gases in, it wouldn't be as important a, a gas. Okay? And so the answer is definitely C. And that's what we measure. If we send probes to go to Venus's atmosphere, if we look at the the sort of chemical signatures we can see, um, then that's what atmos uh, Venus's atmosphere is composed of today. What's missing? What did I say was really important that was released by uh, volcanoes but isn't in Venus's atmosphere? Water, absolutely. Water vapor isn't there for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's combined with sulfur to produce really nasty sulfur dioxide or hydrogen. Uh, sulfuric acid, rather, clouds, those really nasty yellow-looking clouds. They're mainly sulfur uh, uh, acids and gases, which are pretty nasty. Also, for some reason that we're not entirely clear about, Venus doesn't have a magnetic field. It's about the same size as us. We think maybe because it's really rotating very slowly compared to Earth. Um, it doesn't have a magnetic field. And so some of that water vapor in the upper parts of the atmosphere gets stripped out. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why it might not be there anymore. There's still mysteries to understand here. And so I just wanted to quickly comment. So do you remember I showed you that 
image at the beginning with the biosphere, the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, and the geosphere, or the lithosphere. And I said, we can't just look at the atmosphere in isolation. And now you can see why. Because things like the formation of the atmosphere to begin with was caused by volcanoes, by the geosphere. If we look at how that atmosphere changed through time, it's because things have reacted with water, with the hydrosphere, things have dissolved in the ocean, things have gone into the biosphere. The biosphere has massively impacted our atmosphere through time. And so we can't just look at the atmosphere from one point of view, because really all of the ways, all of those uh, reservoirs on Earth influence um, the atmosphere, and we'll continue to see that throughout the class. So, as a quick review, I'm going to end a few minutes early today, um, but really what we did today was how to define our atmosphere, what gases make that up, what are aerosols, what created the first atmosphere and what happened to it, what created the second atmosphere, and how did that second atmosphere get turned into what we have today. Great, I will see you on Thursday.